Without any further ado, Chris is going to introduce our esteemed speaker for the evening. If you can't hear me, just let me know and I'll speak a little bit louder. <laughs> I um, am so happy to be able to introduce this evening Don Linders, who has been an invaluable member to the Nevada County Historical Society. His, his generous talents and his abilities have really been able to enhance the society in ways that we never imagined prior to him being a part of what we do. Uh, in addition to being um, so incredibly talented and gifted with how he's been able to, to enhance the society, he's also an amazing author. His uh, meticulously researched Ditches of Nevada County is um, a phenomenal book and has recently been awarded the Will Rogers Medallion Award for, in the category of Western Photographic Essays. Ooh. So, ladies and gentlemen, Don Linders. Uh, wow. Um, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's an honor to, uh, to speak to you so many of this evening. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, I, I think you know that um, I have a, a, a passion for some of these things. And um, uh, oh. how's the sound level doing? Good. Good? OK. Um, uh, yeah, actually, Desmond's going to turn some lights on. Are you ready? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's not going to throw us into the dark, hopefully. Um, so thank you so much for coming. Um, when, um, uh, how's that? Is that better? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's perfect. That's, that's, that's great, thank you. So um, when, uh, when Dan was looking for topics for a speaker night for 2024, I was just thinking of, of something from uh, that that uh, I could put together without having to do three more three more years of research, and um, uh, and, and this this topic came up. Uh, little did I know that it would suddenly be rather topical um, for uh, you know for what we've got going on. So let's uh, let's actually get into uh, let's get into some of that. I think I might be recruiting Dakota to do some slides. So, the South Yuba Canal. It was built in 18, it was finished in 1857, and still today is the primary artery for water providing us here in, in Nevada County. Uh, 100 million gallons a day, which is quite a bit of water. Uh, and I say supplies, huh, it doesn't, it's not right now, it's been off. <laughs> so what happened? So back in February, there was a rock slide. And uh, you can see here uh, part of where the rocks have come down. So the, the top, as I'll get into this, part of the South Yuba Canal is carried in a 50-inch diameter pipe. And the rock slide took out 250 feet of that. And so that would have been OK. Uh, so one thing you need to understand about who to blame for some of these things, because we always like to blame people, right? So um, uh, NID did indeed buy the South Yuba Canal for one dollar, and it got to, and, and, did, and the uh, South Yuba Canal now is run primarily by uh, NID, except for, you guessed it, the top mile. <laughs> Where did the rock slide happen? Yeah, that's right, the top mile. So uh, it's PGD's responsibility for the rocks. Well, they weren't responsible for the rocks. Can we blame them for the rocks? I blame them for the trees when they fall on the power line. Uh, so the rock slide, it definitely took out uh, the pipeline. That wasn't necessarily their fault. They're fixing it. But at the same time, there was a problem at the Spalding powerhouse where there was a leak. And the backup that would have uh, provided water to bypass through the drum canal down into the South Yuba Canal, that also broke as well, which means we're getting no water from Lake Spalding at all right now. And so hopefully that's going to be fixed in June. But with this, you know, you can see this is actually kind of important about uh, where we get our water from. And the fact that we've got our water 
it, uh, here in the county uh, since 1857 because of this engineering model. So let's, uh, let's get into a little bit more of the story. So I'm going to take you back to the 1850s. Uh, this is what Broad Street looked like in 1857. Um, it's two photos, so you can see there's, there's, a, there's a horse and wagon, but the wagon's kind of was in, wasn't in the other photos, so the church is kind of smushed together. But you get an idea of uh, this is standing at Pine Street, right? So if you're standing in front of the, the chocolate shop, in front of Communal Cafe, looking up the street, uh, that basically you're looking up from, up from there. So where were we? So 1854, that's where we're going to start our story. Uh, three years after the gold rush. And yet, at most of the rest of California, the gold miners had gone home, they'd moved on. Actually, a lot of them went to go live in Napa and Sonoma because they liked the weather. Partly because they were broke and they didn't have any money to go home. So in the, right here, though, the gold rush continued. And in fact, we've been mining gold here and we carried on gold mining gold here until 1957, another 100 years. Um, and that's when we finally started, uh, stopped bringing gold out of the ground. Uh, and that's just because there was so much of it here. So the gold rush hadn't slowed down here at all. And uh, at the time, they were still using really primitive tools, long toms, sluice boxes, uh, just very simple. So hydraulic mining that we all know about was still in its infancy. It was only a year old. In, in 1854. And so they were still using low pressure, they were just using fire hoses, essentially. It's really the best way you can think about it. Low pressure fire hoses. So it was more just like just washing stuff down rather than blasting it out of the way. So the key thing here was that if you wanted to make money as a gold miner, you needed water. If you were panning for gold in your sluice box, even as you got going with the, the mining hoses. And so the key factor, I would say, throughout the 1850s, 1860s, and 1870s, the key determining factor about whether your mining claim was going to make any money was the proximity, availability, and cost of water. So then it kind of gets important about where the water came from. So there were three water companies, the Rock Creek Water Company, the uh, Coyote and Deer Creek Water Company, and the Snow Mountain Water Company. And I'm just I, I'm just going to point this at the <laughs> point of view, the code is going to work better. So, uh, so, oh, actually, so the laser point is going to work better. So here, is the, here are the ditches that provided the water for those, uh, for those three companies. So the, um, oh, you know, it's the battery on this. All right, well, we're going, that's easy. We can put that down. Uh, so the, uh, the, the Coyote and Deer Creek. Uh, ditches are the, the ones close to Deer Creek there, and then above that is the, the Snow Mountain Ditch that still flows today, and then up at the top is the Rock Creek Ditches. And so together, these, these provided about a, a thousand minus inches of water, um, which is just 10 million gallons a, a, a day. So this was quite a lot of water, and yet at the time, um, they already had some plans moving forward. They, the, the, the managers of the different, the owners of the different mine water companies secretly got together and decided to merge to create a monopoly. And part of this was the beginnings of, 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 where, we, uh, of where we get into our story. So this is the, uh, these, these fellows here represent uh, two thirds of the stock of the company that they formed, which was the Rock Creek, Deer Creek, and South Yuba Canal Company. Now, isn't it interesting? So you're combining three companies, the Rock Creek Water Company, the, the uh, Coyote and Deer Creek Water Company, and the Snow Mountain Water Company. You'd have thought you'd have had names coming in from each. But actually, Dan Rich, the top guy, the, the top right, he specifically said, no, I don't want Snow Mountain. It's my company, but I don't want Snow Mountain in the name. You, we should call it the South Yuba Canal Company. And the other directors were like, well, why? We don't, we're not going to get any water from South Yuba Canal. It's miles away. But he was really insistent, and that's what stuck. But you can see these, uh, these fellows. Um, they, uh, you know, they're in the, uh, the, the youngest, Charles Marsh, the former county surveyor. Uh, the youngster, just 30 years old. Uh, the rest of them sort of in their mid-30s to 40s. Uh, 
these essentially owned all of the water coming into town. So with the, with the merged company, they, they got together the idea that, okay, we're actually going to start a bold new project. And the reason for this was that for nine months of the year, essentially when it wasn't raining, they never had enough water to actually satisfy what they could sell. The miners just wanted more and more water. And so for nine months of the year, uh, they didn't have, they, if they had more, they could sell. They could just carry on selling, they could sell twice as much, three times as much, four times as much. And so they realized they needed to bring in something beyond Deer Creek, beyond Rock Creek. And so hence the idea of, well, how about water from the South Yuga? They even decided on a name, as Dan Rich knew, the South Yuga Canal. So at the time, so you may have heard of a fellow called uh, Aaron Sargent. Uh, during most of this story, he's the editor of the Nevada Journal. Um, uh, but obviously later he became a lawyer, and uh, later on he became a, a congressman for our, our, our district here. And later on then still, he became a US Senator, uh, United States Senator for California. And uh, he, he said, he, in, 19, in 1856, he called the South Yuba Canal the most stupendous ditch operation in the state. And, uh, and it, it was true, this was, this was the potentially the largest engineering project that anybody had ever considered. So, but the thing is here, it wasn't their idea. They stole the idea of the whole thing. They didn't have the original or first water right on South Yuba, somebody else had it. They didn't bother to survey the path for it, about where it would go. And they didn't even come up with a name. Something a little suspicious here. So the South Yuba Mining and Sacramento Canal Company. It's a mouthful, right? So that, they actually was founded in June of 1851 uh, by some uh, uh, Nevada City businessmen, um, uh, one of whom, Hannah Davis, was actually the, the first mayor of Nevada City. Uh, he wasn't the first official mayor. That was uh, Moses Hoyt. Uh, Hannah Davis got elected mayor, and then they realized that the papers that they drew up for the city actually hadn't been validated in some way, uh, and they hadn't been filed correctly and certified by the state of California. And so the, the first may, uh, mayoral election was, was canceled, it was bogus. So he was nearly mayor for three months. <laughs> uh, John Day, uh, so he was, uh, he was from Grass Valley. Uh, the rest of these fellows are all, all nearly all from the Grass Valley. Uh, John Day was um, uh, a surveyor and uh, lived in Grass Valley, and actually uh, later on became uh, the, uh, the county surveyor as well. So Day went up to the South Yuba in, uh, in July of 1852, and surveyed and, and, and tried to work out how to actually bring water from the South Yuba, uh, South Yuba River watershed over into the Deer Creek or Wolf Creek or Bear Valley uh, uh, watershed. And um, he, uh, he estimated, I mean, you know, they, they founded this company with one sole purpose, to build the South Yuba Canal. Let's just not be under any illusion about that. So he estimated that the cost would be about a million dollars. So uh, for inflation, um, rough math here, you can times by about 30, 33. So, you know, about 30, 35 million dollars for the construction, so a chunk of change. Uh, but most critically is that they found that the only way you could bring water in anything like a reasonable fashion was through one spot called the Bear Valley Gap. Okay, so how many of you have been up to Lake Bowman or up uh, Lake Bowman Road? Okay, everybody knows where Lake Bowman is, right? Okay, so as you drive up Lake Bowman and you come over the crest of the hill, uh, you actually cross Bear River and you come over the crest of the hill and then suddenly before you is the South Yuba Canyon. That is the Bear Valley Gap. And in fact, uh, they, uh, they built a house there. It's a Bear Valley house. It's just right there at the corner. And it's not a coincidence that that is also the same point where you happen to have driven over Yes, that's right, the South Yuba Canal, because that's where it went, goes through. But they worked out that was the only place you could pass, put, uh, you could actually engineer it through. Because as he quoted in the, uh, in the survey, the canyon is so high and perpendicular that access to the stream is impossible for man or beast. It's a nice, uh, some nice old words. Um, okay, just keep going. 
So, okay, so we're going to take a look. So the, the, the map here, actually, hang on. I don't know whether we're going Okay, found another laser point. Okay, so lace falling, um, uh, Bear Valley Gap is just here, right? So uh, Bear Valley coming down here. This is the top of Deer Creek, uh, so that's where. Uh, so just just further to the left there is Scotts Flat. Okay. So uh, where we're talking about here, so so from here we, we're talking about this is the South Yuba Canyon, and obviously with that, without Lake Spalding being there, uh, South Yuba goes up here. This is Jordan Creek. Um, so this is the survey route. So this is exactly the route that uh, John Day surveyed uh, to go along down Bear Valley, across uh, Steep Hollow Creek, and over into the Deer Creek watershed. So what they were talking about, the, the, the canyon with the high and perpendicular cliffs. Oh yeah, this is the view from Bear Valley Gap. So this is looking west down the South Yuba River, right? So the South Yuba River sort of uh, comes down through here. So they, the point was, we're not going to be building a ditch along here. It's a little tricky. And yet, uh, ironically, um, later on, um, the, the, the ditch builders actually built two different ditches and flumes that went straight along here, all the way around here, that went to Blue Tent for the really large hydraulic mines. So and, uh, and here's actually a picture of this is the Omega flu. So this is looking in the opposite direction. So we, we, the, the earlier photo was taken up there. So this is, you can see the cliff here and the flu. Um, so this was built in, I think, the 1870s, uh, 1880s. Um, and actually, this was uh, got rebuilt a few times. This was working until uh, about 1920. Uh, they even built a small little railroad on top of this to actually to build the construction of it. Absolutely crazy. Hey, I digress. <laughs> So the South Yuba Mining and Canal Company. So uh, they worked out, okay, it's gonna cost a million dollars. It's 22 miles of ditch, all right? But this was a sort of a, a kind of a fancy, fictitious map. So this map was, um, uh, was, was actually printed in England to sell stock for the company to, uh, to foreigners. So it was all, Europe was just, uh, particularly Britain, was, was fascinated with buying money in, in, uh, in uh, American companies. Um, and it was difficult to tell sometimes uh, which ones were, um, what should we say, bona fide companies and which ones weren't, <laughs> being nice about it. Uh, so this map is, is really strange. So you can see up the top here, those are sort of the crinkly bits. This is actually the, the, the part that matters. And then magically from here, oh, the, the water is suddenly now going to travel down here, magically 40 miles without any further effort. <laughs> okay, all right. Oh, and then the, and the, little, the little dots are, are, are weirdly marked towns that need water. Um, and some of, the, some of the towns are kind of made up. So the, the, the map's a little suspicious here. Um, but uh, they did do some work. Um, as I said, they, they, they actually built Bear Valley House. So if you, if you, as you're going over Bear Valley Gap at the, the top of Bay, uh, uh, Bowman Lake Road, um, you'll see there's a PG&E building over on the right. And that's actually still used by PG&E contractors today um, for housing and, and local things. And so that, that is actually the only remnant of the South Yuba Mining and uh, Sacramento Canal Company. It's the fact that Bear Valley House is still there. So they look for investors. Um, one of the founders, uh, uh, Co Thomas Coburn, he even hired a famous British engineer. It's like, oh, he's going to come in. He's going to take charge of it all, and it's all going to be wonderful. Yeah, made up resume. Uh, complete fake. Uh, um, so uh, they hired Aaron Sargent to be on the board for good PR. And, uh, but you know, it, it didn't really matter. The part of the problem, everybody thought it was a scam. And part of the reason is that Coburn and his partner, William Rigby, um, uh, who was, by the way, a convicted felon, uh, <laughs> they had been, so they were the directors of the Bunker Hill Mine that had defrauded investors out of $80,000 the year before. So, oh, um, would you like to invest in my company? Oh, don't worry about that I ran the Bunker Hill thing last year. That was a, that was a different thing. This, this one's a good one, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you get the idea, right? Yeah, about a million dollars. Okay, so uh, the interesting thing is they actually did get, they actually got um, one of the world's leading Victorian map makers. Um, the guy that created this map here, this is a, a, an accurate map. Um, uh, I looked him up. He was actually responsible for some of the, you know, so at the time the British were busy conquering all parts of the world and making it pink. Uh, do you know what the pink, pink British Empire map looks like? Okay, don't worry. Uh, the, uh, a world-renowned map maker. 
And so he actually made this map. And, and the accurate part here, this is the South Yoba Canal as planned. And then it actually shows the other ditches of the ditch company as they were. And it says in small print here, um, our other ditch here would be unnecessary if we purchased their ditches. Okay, so, uh, so um, Hidden Waterbury actually got offered a million dollars for the ditch company um, if, they, if they would hand over the rest of their monopoly to make the South Yuba Canal work. Uh, they declined because they knew the million dollars didn't exist. It's pretty easy. Um, they, the, the, uh, the, the old ditch company finally did find an investor. Um, however, on his, uh, uh, on his way, uh, on his, actually on his way back from visiting Nevada City and visiting uh, uh, Bear Valley, he was on a, a steamboat that exploded just outside Sacramento in January 1855. Uh, quite a few people died in the, in the explosion. Um, he just uh, he, he he just got uh, as the newspaper called it got maimed. Uh, he, uh, his, he he had a, he had a leg injury for life. Let's just put it that way. Um, but needs to say, he didn't want to have anything to do with California after that. It's like, I want to get better, I want to go home, and his name was never mentioned again up here. So, um, uh, but in the meantime, there was this big argument between, uh, you know, Aaron Sargent wrote this angry op-ed op uh, talking about how the ditch company were liars and blackmailers. It started to get nasty. But in secret, uh, Kidd and company, they secretly started construction. So here we are at uh, the bottom of the South Yuba River Canyon. Uh, there's a nice little waterfall there. And do you see what you see up in the background here? That's the South Yuba Canal right there. So it was about here that, um, uh, uh, go ahead. In, uh, in February, the cat was out of the bag and this secret construction, everybody had heard about it. And so uh, Colburn, uh, actually persuaded, he went up to Omega, up to the miners, the miners up there, and got 60 of them to say, all right, uh, you've got to help me. These people have stolen my water rights, and they're building a dam where I want to build it. Will you help me kick them off? And they're, oh, and if you come, I'll give you a free lunch. <laughs> so the miners said, sure, I'll come for the free lunch. They came and had a look. So you can imagine uh, 60 miners taking the day off for their free lunch, and, uh, and, and, and Coborn and his, uh, his, his, his partner, Rigby, uh, they went up and, and they met somewhere around where this waterfall is. And there they found Charles Marsh, the surveyor, Dan Rich, the, uh, the, the ditch guy, and uh, John Dunn with seven crew members. And they were starting to do some surveying and get it, a dam together. And so obviously this, this 60 people, um, it, was, it was pretty intimidating. And uh, Coburn started shouting. Uh, Marsh later recorded there were rude words said. <laughs> um, so there's a bit of pushing and shoving, um, but needless to say, um, they weren't going to move. And uh, then during the free lunch, uh, Dan Rich actually took some of the miners aside and said, hey, do you want to see the work that they've actually done? These people are you know, trying to kick us off. And they, they found uh, there was about 50 feet of ditch that had been dug. So they'd been working on it for four years. And uh, it's about two days' work uh, back back then. And so at this point, all the miners were like, "Oh, guy, you guys, it's, it, this is this is this, this isn't worth it. We're, we're out of here. We've had our lunch. Thank you, guy." So, uh, oh, and, and needless to say, Kogan says, "I'll see you in court." So it leads us to there's the courthouse, right? So it's looking down Pine Street. Uh, so JJ uh, Jackson's is here. Uh, Fryer Tucks is here, um, uh, chocolate shops here, courthouse in the So, um, so Coburn sued, and uh, he, he wanted them to stop work, an injunction, uh, hundred thousand dollars in damages, and um, uh, basically they accused Kidd and Company of, of trespassing. Now, there's a bit of a problem with that: is that a water right? Uh, but it's back then. You can have a water right. Um, without actually owning the land. And they didn't own the land. Nobody owned the land. Actually, I'll be very fair. Um, the, Nisana, uh, the Nisanan had been on this land for about 10,000 years at this point. So I'm not sure it was the US government's, but it certainly wasn't, didn't belong to these guys. So uh, by December 1855, a judge agreed, you can't trespass a water right. And anyway, we're not stopping you from building a dam. You go build a dam. We're not stopping you. So 
the case was dismissed. And that was over. But you know, Kidd and Wadenry, they, they weren't the sort of people just to let something go. So just saying, ah, we won the court case, that's fine. So it was around this time, the spring of 1855, that Kidd started buying up uh, Hamlet Davis's um, credit. So the whole town worked on, on credit notes. So you know, so when you went into the grocery store, when you went to go get some supplies, you know, basically just uh, made your mark if you couldn't write or you signed your name. It's like, okay, I'll put you down for, you know, $12.50 or something. And I've got a credit note, you know, from me to you to a name. And that was then used actually as currency around town. So you could actually take a credit note and you could give it to somebody else. And it's like, okay, just passing on. So you could actually go and buy up somebody's credit if you actually wanted to really go after them. And that included uh, going up, uh, including getting into their uh, mortgages. And so it didn't take long for kids to buy up all of, of, of Hamlet Davis's uh, uh, credit and Coburn's credit and uh, foreclosed on the United States Hotel that Hamlet Davis owned. So that's the communal cafe, is the United States the side of the United States Hotel. And, uh, and Davis's store, interestingly, was opposite where the cafe is. So it's where the chocolate shop is. Right? So, uh, so shortly after, Hamlet Davis was broke. He moved to Dutch Flats, started growing fruit and vegetables. Uh, actually ended up, he was one of the first settlers of Truckee, actually. Started selling uh, groceries in Truckee. Um, similar thing happened to, to Coburn. He just uh, bought up the credit, forced them to bankruptcy. So needless to say, by, the, by 1856, a year later, those two had no interest in building a canal. They were broke. I want to get away from kid, particularly. So, um, so when the, the next time you go by, yes, the Kid Knox building, right? George Kid and uh, Dr. William Knox. Just remember that that property was acquired by putting somebody else out of business and driving them out of town. And coincidentally, they acquired the property in the spring of 1856 um, and decided, oh, we'll start building in August. They didn't know that in July 1856, the entire town was going to burn down. So actually, their, their building plans in August, this building was built just after the fire. Um, they could have built it just before the fire, and they could have been unlucky. But that's one of the reasons we uh, have that wonderful building. And it's a, it was a, you can see the, the roof. There's actually there's a big uh, dramatic hole inside upstairs, as well as offices. It was used for law offices for a long time. Anyway, digress again. So with some of that backstory, We'll now actually just move on to some of the engineering. So this is the, the dam at the top of the South Yuba Canal. And this is where it starts to get interesting. So you can see, uh, so this photo was taken in 1884, so um, about 140 years ago. Uh, you'll notice the snow. So here's the dam, and you can see the water is flowing over. And then here is the flume that runs around here. And you see this little, there's a little doorway, and there's nothing. That's actually, it's a 60-foot tunnel that goes through from the back of here all the way behind there and come and pops out. Um, so that's the first thing they had to do, was they had to build them, and then the first thing they had to do was build a 60 foot tunnel through uh, solid bedrock. And if you took, if you took this photo today, I, I haven't been able to get up, up to here. Uh, this is completely inaccessible. Um, but if you took this photo today, you see where this tree is? The, the horizon would actually be cut off by the dam of Lake Spalding. So if you so if you if you go to the, the if you go to the, the dam of Lake Spalding and look down, yeah. you can actually see down into the canyon down in here. So uh, so in January uh, 1855, they were still doing it secretly. Um, Marsh, Dunn, and Rich and a crew went up to camp in, in Bear Valley, and, uh, and, and uh, it's like this is detailed in, in uh, 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 several uh, court cases that. Uh, I'd look through, and there's testimony about exactly where and when they were doing all of this. Um, so Marsh described how he chiseled the line. So basically, so on the uh, on, on that shack doorway on the rock behind, he actually took a chisel and marked out the line for where the tunnel needed to go. And he did that on January 24, 1855. That's just amazing. So, um, and you can actually see, actually go back one minute and see without the words. So you can actually see here, there's a, there's a wooden ladder here. Um, but I don't know how they get down there. Um, and also, it must have been mild. I cannot imagine they were doing this with this, even this amount of snow. Can you imagine going up there, slippery rocks? Dave. So was this one of the first um, bedrock diversion tunnels in the town? 
Oh, is this the first? Is this one of the first bedrock diversion tiles? Um, I would say yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Say. And it was certainly some of the most significant uh, tunnel digging that was done in the 1850s. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, okay, so they started out uh, and they, they finished the 60 foot tunnel by, uh, by May. Cost us $60,000. Um, we'll get on to how they blasted that out in a second, but um, it was blasted out by hand. Uh, dynamite wasn't invented until 1867 and wasn't commercially available until in, around here, until about 1875. So this is all done using gunpowder. Okay, so this flume. So the, the first mile, remember we were talking about the first mile, the, the top <coughs> mile that pg and &E still owns? Okay, this is what we're talking about. So it's, it's, uh, it's 4,900 feet, pretty much along, it's not a vertical cliff, but vertical is relative. It's about 70 degrees. And you can't climb up or down it without getting hurt. Let's just put it that way. So the way they did this is they obviously started at both ends, but most of it was by hanging guys down on ropes. And so there was, there was ropes, and you know, like it would be a, a long swing, so you're sitting on a plank of wood with, with, two, with a piece of rope. And so a team of two, I need to put this down for a second. So a team of two, so one guy would be holding a very large chisel, steel, so it would be about a three or four foot steel. And the other guy would be holding a sledgehammer. So they're on swings, hanging down the mountain, and they'd be banging it, and the guy would turn it a quarter turn, bang, quarter turn, bang, quarter turn. Do it for 15 minutes, and then maybe switch jobs, just so they don't get bored. Um, it would take a couple of hours to drill an 18 inch hole. They'd pull the chisel out. they very carefully pour in gunpowder, and even more gently nudge it in, along with a safety fuse. So just imagine, you've seen the you know, pirate movies, right? You've seen the pirate movie, keg of gunpowder, safety fuse, light hit, blah, blah, blah. Exact, just think that, just think that. And so they used to form a series of holes to blast out the cliff. Uh, holes are about two feet apart, 18 inches deep, boom. And then part of the ledge, then actually, and then they move on to the next part. And behind, it, behind them, they would actually proceed with um, uh, building uh, a, a rock foundation, building a dry rock wall uh, to, to, to form the foundation for, uh, for this flume. Okay, so we're talking about here, so let's give you the, that's the top mile, right? Okay, let's keep going. So we're, we're going to take a look at what that looks like. So this is what it looks like today. So this is looking west, so the South Yoba River is down here, uh, Bear Valley Gap's there, and then uh, South Yoba carries on down, Jordan, uh, Jordan Creek comes in from the right. So you can see the pipeline today, just going all the way along there. Isn't that amazing? Mile long. So just to zoom in a little, do you see how there's a the rock foundation, so the dry rock wall? So that's pretty much the same dry rock wall that they built there in 1855 to 1857. And it's still there holding up today's pipeline. Obviously the flumes rotted away, they replaced it with pipe. And so here's a different view. Um, so this is looking back up the canyon. And in fact, you can see, so th this, is, this is fairly accessible, and I'll, I'll tell you why in, in, a, in a second, but Beyond here, it goes around a corner, and the, the, the top like quarter mile, completely inaccessible. It's really steep. Uh, I got as far as about, I don't know, about here. Uh, and you, you can't climb up there without, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to go risk anything. But, uh, but you can see you know, all of this going on here. And what I noticed when I was over here, and I was looking at this photo, I was just going like, hang on a second. I remember this, there's a pond here. So. And I worked out, this is where the rock slide is. So this is what the rock slide looks today. So imagine covered in snow, right? So the pipeline ends here, and the pipeline, it, so it's about 250 feet. Bit of a mess. And so you can zoom in, so here are the PG&E guys, and you can see, you can see the size, there's a 50 inch pipe there. And they're building new concrete uh, um, pylons to, to put the pipeline on. Um, while I love blaming PG&E for anything, um, I think I will say, um, if you're working day and night, like they weren't, they're working the day, um, it also might be a little bit, it might be completed a little bit faster if you have more than five guys working on it. <laughs> Just saying, 
uh, if PG&E is, because I'm sorry, if NID is saying, well, we're waiting on PG&E. It's like, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the flume. So this is actually a, a, a model, a 3D model of what the flume looks like. So they did it in 12 foot sections. And so it has incredibly large pieces of wood, so the stringer that goes at the bottom. So it's an eight by 12, eight inches by 12 inches. So think about that, it's, it's 12 feet long and it's about one and a half times the size of a, of a railroad tie. So it's, it's chunkier than a railroad tie. And that's just, that, that's the large piece. So, um, and then you've also got uh, these um, planks and then battens. Um, and so today we can actually see an example of this. So um, off Berger Road in Willow Valley, um, there's a section of the Snow Mountain Ditch uh, across uh, Neversweck Ravine. And you can actually see this exactly the same design. Um, and so this was, this was from the 1960s. But nothing, nothing much changed in the flume design in about 100 years. What type of wood? I'm sorry? They use oak. Oh, what type of wood? Uh, so a good question, what type of wood? Um, pretty much anything they could find. Um, they loved um, sugar pine, was their favorite. Um, but most of it was uh, 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 sugar pine, um, ponderosa, or fir um, was the, were the, were the, were the, were the things that they used. Um, well, thanks for that question because we're going to get onto a little bit more detail. I hadn't thought about what type of tree, but we'll get onto a bit more of that. So uh, here's part of the steep part of the canyon. So, um, uh, so it was in February, they'd been going about a month. A kid went up to visit um, and he, he was talking to the foreman, and the foreman must have said in a gruff voice, he's like, Ugh, this is damnable country to building a ditch through. That statement was actually was, was struck out in a court record because damnable was his curse word. Okay. Don't you be cursing in front of me. Um, kids just nonchalantly replied, well, it would have to be done. Uh, what's, uh, what's sad is that uh, uh, two men died while they were building that rock foundation um, from gunpowder uh, gun accidents. Um, yeah, it's, it, was, uh, it, was, it was dangerous work. Um, uh, so uh, it was by, by April they surveyed the entire length of the canal and, uh, and then started clearing it. And so we'll, we'll uh, take a look in a little bit more detail about uh, having some of the rest of it. Okay, so just to give you a, a proper view, I did a, so I went up last week to take a look because I, I wanted to go see where the rock slide was. Um, so this is just, um, oh, just hit the uh, play. Just even hit the space. Give you a sense of, um, of what the canyon looks like. So there's the rock slide coming into view here. So uh, if you ever want to go for a walk up the Pioneer Trail, it's mostly accessible, but you have to do some rock scampering up here. So. Um, but it's a pretty impressive view. Okay, so let's talk about uh, once they got past the cliff. So they carried on with the rock foundation, um, six foot wide, sometimes eight foot wide, going all the way down Bear Valley. And so you can see here, so this is the, this is the modern uh, uh, flume that uh, carries the water today. But you see here the rock foundation? It doesn't look pristine. It looks like it was built like last week. Um, but that's the original rock foundation that used to have a flume sitting on it. Just, it's an amazing condition. And in fact, it's, it's in, uh, while the modern flume goes by it, this, this winds its way down um, Bear Valley. It just, it's in, in pristine condition nearly all the way. So uh, the seven miles required about 4,300 pieces of large timber and an additional 31,000 pieces of planking, which they, which they which had to be a mill, mill song. Um, they actually dragged and carried up a two-ton steam boiler to actually get a, a, a mill going uh, up in Bear Valley. Um, each mile also needed about 200,000 nails. Jatted up. They came in kegs, though. So, okay, so what we're talking about here is this is the seven miles, so this has been the main, main stretch of Bear Valley. Oh, uh, little known fact, um, before the last ice age, um, David can probably tell us more about this, but uh, during the last ice age, Bear, that Bear River used to go in the opposite direction. And then it got cut off by a glacier here, and that's why now it flows down here, because it's got nowhere else to go. But it used to flow into the South Yorker. Okay. 
so this this is the this is the modern flume. I have to say, I just this is just a fantastic picture. It's just a, 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 a marvel of engineering just for the for the, for the, the modern flume. Um, uh, so you, what you've got to understand is that in constructing this, so that the whole seven miles of flume, so about um, two million board feet of lumber, um, and about a million and a half nails. It was quite a sizable project, and and the whole thing had to be replaced every ten to fifteen years. Complete. No, they tried to repair it, so some pieces of it lasted 20, 30 years, but other pieces only lasted five or six years. So the whole thing had to be replaced quite regularly. Uh, so finally, as they were going down to the end of Bear Valley, they, uh, they, they reached the ridge, and, uh, and, and Marsh re realized that if he cut under the hill with a tunnel, he could actually save about a mile of ditch. And so they called it Little Tunnel, and this is where Little Tunnel emerges in, the, in, the, in Steep Hollow. And uh, this is what it looks like when it's empty. You can actually see the light at the end of the tunnel. So it's, actually, it's, uh, it's about 300 feet long. So the original was um, about seven foot wide, um, about six foot high. Um, and then in the, in the, the 1960s, um, they lined it with concrete. So you used to have a flume running down the middle. Um, again, that also needs to be maintained. But uh, so they replaced it with uh, lined it with concrete. Uh, and that's as, as you can see it today. Okay, so once you get through the, uh, the, the little tunnel, you're now into diggable dirt. So they had eight miles of ditch. Oh, and another tunnel. So this section is from across the, the two forks of the steep hollow. And it's actually only about two miles across here, but they had to eight miles of zigzag to make it up around the uh, and, and steep hollow creek, it's because it's steep. <laughs> So here you can see the, the, the modern ditch just winding around, um, just around the hill. So just, it's, you can see why there's, there's lots of snaky turns. Um, and so what, once we get to here, um, so I actually have to just go back for a moment. So uh, that's because this, this is likely my favorite story. Is, so we're now, this is, the, this is the flume back in Bear River. And this is about where, uh, uh, near where it crosses 20. So if you're going uh, along Bear uh, uh, along 20, uh, just come over the crest of the hill down into Bear Valley, going down the hill, and you cross over the, the flume right there. Um, and that's, it's nearby here. And so this is also perhaps a public service announcement for NID. Um, uh, you'll see why. Um, just think, safety first. Okay. Um, so uh, there, were a couple of, uh, there were a couple of guys. Uh, his, their names, uh, a couple of miners from, uh, from Omega, um, named Ostrom and uh, Van Franken, uh, they're out hunting. And, you know, people used to use the ditches as sort of walkways, as thoroughfares, because there weren't any roads up there anywhere. anywhere. Um, and so they're out hunting, and they're on their way walking back towards town, and they're walking along the South Yuba Canal, the flume of the South Yuba Canal, right? So they're about two feet apart, four inches. You've got to be careful. Well, Van Franken slips, and he falls, and he, he must have dislocated his hip or something, but he, was, he, he couldn't walk, he couldn't move at all. And so they're like, oh my goodness, okay, what's going on? So uh, Ostra manages to find, uh, so they're, they're always doing maintenance to these flumes, so Ostra manages to find a plank, and he puts Van Vranken on the plank, and he's dragging him along the top of the flume, right? So he's, he's got to make sure he doesn't fall, right? He's dragging the plank with the guy. In. Okay, so they make it all the way from uh, somewhere along Bear Valley, I'm not sure, but heading downstream, and they make it all the way to Little Tunnel, and then they, they have to, he has to crawl through, so there's a flume, seven foot high, uh, sorry, six foot high, that he can crawl along the top of the flume inside the tunnel, and then he emerges back where we saw, and then, okay, so go, actually go back a slide. Um, there you go. So then they emerge through Little Tunnel, and they're going down here. Now, it's going like, okay, well, I, I can't carry him. I can't carry him on the plank down here. So what am I going to do? So there was a bunch of other lumber and left over. So he, he built a little raft uh, that could fit in the canal. <laughs> the problem is, is by the time you put Van Vranken on top of the little raft, there wasn't enough water. It was kind of sinking down. And so he, he got some more lumber, and he, and, he, and he went and built a little dam <laughs> with, the, with the lumber. And the water rose up, and it was enough water to float the raft with Frank Frank and I, down to the dam, and then he'd take down the dam, and the water, he'd go run down another few hundred feet, and then build another little dam, and the water would float up, and he'd float in there. Three miles down here, he did that. 
It took them six hours of walking on top of the flume through the tunnel and then three miles of dam building on the canal until he finally found a house and found somebody, uh, and a horse and a wagon that could take him into town. But I have to say, it's like, talk about perseverance. It's like, good rescue job. Um, uh, safety first, do we walk on top of flumes on the uh, friend ID? Think about it. Okay. Oh, sorry, yeah, that was, uh, that, that's actually the story. So, from the Nevada Journal, um, from 1861. Um, so you can, uh, you, you can actually look up. If you look up Van Branken and Ostrom, on um, uh, uh, California Digital and, and, uh, Newspaper Collection. Um, I can send you the link as well. It's, it's a fun story. Okay, so uh, the dish. So this is actually what it looks, that's what it looked like 100 years ago. Uh, it's actually 100. And I think I found the exact spot um, 100 years later, uh, except it's, it's lined with concrete now. Uh, to cross St. Polo Creek, they built a flume, because they could either build a ditch all the way up and then all the way back down, or they could actually just sneak across. And so they built, um, uh, so they built a 500-foot flume across Steep Hollow Creek. Um, uh, it's about 160, 200 feet off the, the creek bed. Um, 2,000 man hours of, of labor from competence to build it. Um, and uh, less than 10 years later, covered in snow, the whole thing collapsed. Oops. So they thought, hmm, this is, this is a little bit too big. So let's go further up the ravine, and then we'll cut across, and it'll be a, it was a shorter, shorter cut across. So they, they, halved, they halved the length of the, of, the, uh, of the flume. So it ended up with a, a 200 foot flume. And then on the other fork of, uh, of, of uh, the Steep Hollow Creek, there's, a, there's another 200 foot uh, creek. And, uh, and this is what it looks like today. So there's a, there's a modern flume that goes across the same, same, same spot. Okay, so the final stretch is this piece to go from Steep Hollow over into the Deer Creek watershed. And so um, they had to build a tunnel. So this is what it looks like inside a big tunnel, a 3,000 foot long tunnel, um, uh, eight foot wide, um, 10, no, sorry, 10 foot high, eight foot wide, and you used to have a large flume going through the middle. Um, it saved about three to seven miles of ditch digging, ditch digging. Uh, ditch digging. Um, but the tunnel, they quickly realized, they'd, they'd, they'd been at the whole canal just for a few months, and they realized that this was going to be the showstopper. This was going to be the longest, hardest project that they were going to be working on. Um, and so they actually, by, by uh, September 1856, they had 200 people working on this. This is a serious engineering. And to give you a, an idea, I mean, this is, if you've ever been up off um, Lowell Hill Road, or Chalk Bluff Road, or up near the Deer Creek Powerhouse, um, the roads aren't very good now. <laughs> um, weather, yeah, December, uh, January 1857, there was 12 feet of snow at either end of the tunnel. So how do you start moving stuff around uh, if you've got... Um... So uh, here's a section of the, of the, the, the timber inside the tunnel. Um, and so some of it's, uh, a lot of it's concrete lines now, but there are still some parts that are either timber or, or how it looks originally. Um, so it was going so slowly, they actually thought, oh, we can dig a hole, we're, we're digging like this, we can dig a hole in the middle, go down, and then we can actually start digging out sideways. So they actually had not just two faces, but they had four faces. And so they, they it's doubled the speed, and they could put a lot, a lot more, a lot more uh, people working on it. And what's interesting is that they never filled in that construction shelf. Uh, PG&E obviously realized it was something, and in uh, 2015, PG&E actually filled it in. And they, they, they backfilled it with foam, waterproof clay, eight feet of concrete, and then a re, uh, rebar-filled concrete pad on top. You can't accuse them for not doing it properly, at least. Um, so, and, so this gives you an idea. So the water's coming in from the right, coming out from the left, um, into Deer Creek. This just floats right into the, uh, the, the top of Deer Creek. And here's the, the mid-construction mid shaft. Uh, so this is from 1955 when they started uh, um, lining up the concrete. Okay, so while they were finishing off the tunnel, because uh, it was it was delaying the project, everybody was waiting for the water. Um, they actually started, well, what are we going to do with the water when it starts coming down the canal? And so they started building an extensive uh, ditch network. So um, so South Yellow Canal here, right, big tunnel, uh, chalk bluff ditch. Uh, and this part is still active because that's the Deer Creek powerhouse uh, right here today. 
and then go down the Scots Line. But then they built the, the ridge ditch that went all the way down here uh, to the top of Rock Creek. Uh, so this is the Washington Conservancy area uh, off, um, off Highway 20. Um, and so it all passed White Cloud, uh, Jefferson Creek, and they also had spur, they had a long spur going down to uh, Alpha and Omega. So that's another, that's uh, 30 miles, 13 miles, 10 miles. Uh, so they, with, with the South Yuba Canal, they could get to, they could get water to nearly anywhere in Western Nevada County. Um, the only limitation was uh, elevation. Um, they, they couldn't pump it uphill. No question. What is the ditch that goes along the Bear River by the Bear River? Oh, okay. So uh, what was the, what's the, what's the ditch that goes along uh, Bear River down, uh, down here? So that's the Drum Canal. Oh. Yeah. And so that's the, the, the primary water source that goes down to Dutch Flats and also then down to Auburn. Um, and it also provides water that, uh, uh, also down to Rollins, um, and also as the, uh, theoretically, as the backup for uh, Scott's flat. Another question? Were the Chinese involved in any of the labor? Oh, good question. Were the Chinese involved in any of the labor? Um, so I looked at this in detail, um, and you know, one of the things is um, uh, the, the use of Chinese labor is very well documented for the, um, uh, the, uh, by the Central Pacific Railroad in, in the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, I can tell you that uh, for, this, for all of this construction, every single last piece, uh, there was no Chinese labor involved at all. And the reason is, is because it would take away work from the honest Joe. Um, so later on, so one of the uh, blue tent ditches um, did actually try to use, they, they switched out half their, labor, half their, their construction uh, crews. And this was, this was later, this was about 1870, uh, early, yeah, the late 1870s. Um, they switched out half their crew to help construct the blue tent ditch, which was next to the one that we saw on the, the, the Omega flu. Um, they started for a couple of weeks, and the miners um, from North Bloomfield, from Malakoff, uh, uh, came over with, um, essentially, you can imagine them coming over with pitchforks, but actually they came over with sledgehammers. And they came over and started smashing up dams and flumes and anything they could find that had been built with, by, with Chinese labor. And so within two weeks, um, the construction company, the, the, the Blue Tent Mining Company, had uh, negotiated <laughs> with, with the miners to agree that they would only use white labor, so it was um, uh, so there was there was deliberate industrial sabotage at the time. So any time before, uh, at least at least for, for, for gold mining and for, for ditch construction, it was industrial sabotage was used for any company that was using Chinese labor, um, which in itself says an awful lot about um, what was going on. That's a really good question. Okay, so. Um, uh, and, oh, if, and if you want to see the ridge ditch, you can actually still see it. It's it's quite large. Um, but, you know, this is uh, this is what took water over to. Um, uh, sorry, go back on. Um, took water down to um, uh, Washington and uh, all the way to Blue Tent, and then so so some of the water that could have made it to Nevada City was coming down here. So this is just this is just below um, uh, below Highway 20 near uh, Washington Road. Okay, so uh, just to nearly finish up here. So. By Thanksgiving, 1857, the, the tunnel was finally finished. All of the flumes, all of the ditch was all finally finished. The water was started flowing. So total cost about $600,000, um, which today would be about 20 million. Um, although, let's, let's think about this. So uh, do you know how the cost of lumber has gone up, right? Uh, so can you imagine trying to pay for uh, that number of uh, 2, million, 2 million board feet of lumber? <laughs> I think it would be an astronomical cost if you were trying to do that today. Um, although you probably, it would, it would normally need to be done by hand. So water was flowing down into Deer Creek, and then they picked up the water at uh, Scott's Flat into the Snow Mountain Ditch and other places. And what's interesting is that their competitors, because uh, they still had some there, were more than happy to borrow the water out of Deer Creek. Um, because the, 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 the South Yuba Canal Company were just literally using Deer Creek as a cheap way to, to bring water down to town. Um, but once it was in a public waterway, like Deer Creek, it was anybody's water. And so, uh, particularly famously, uh, Amos Laird, um, who built the Cascade Ditch, Cascade Ditch named for the Cascade Falls, where the dam of the Cascade Ditch stopped, 
Um, that's where Cascade Shoals comes from, for example. Um, uh, so uh, it took until 1861. Um, they bought up all of Laird's credits, put him out of business, and he went into exile in Montana. Um, although, interestingly, he did, did come back to retire. In, in, uh, he, he retired in Washington. Uh, so, but the same thing, uh, they, didn't, they didn't take to, to competitors very lightly. So, uh, and you can see here the, uh, the, the left-hand part of the building here, uh, while it's today, it's the Chamber of Commerce uh, downtown. Um, that used to be the office of the South Europe Canal Company, um, and uh, uh, was the headquarters of the company from 1857 until uh, 1880. Yeah. Oh, Can you yeah. Thank you. Is there anybody uh, with some medical training in the house? I have CPR. Is her heart going? Yes. She's She's passing out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. need to call 911. Yes. Does anyone call 